This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is Charles Gasparino, senior correspondent for the Fox Business Network and a columnist for the New York Post. He's also the author of the new book, Go Woke, Go Broke, the inside story of the radicalization of corporate America. Gasparino analyzes major missteps by companies such as Anheuser-Busch, Target, and Disney, and he explores how top CEOs and management became entranced by things like stakeholder capitalism, DEI programs, and ESG plans to the detriment of customer satisfaction, public relations, and the bottom line. Four years out from COVID and the death of George Floyd, we talk about whether we're past peak woke and why he views people like Ed Renzi, the former head of McDonald's, as models for how businesses can make profits while being socially responsible. And we discuss how the 2024 election will impact the economy. Here is The Reason Interview with Charles Gasparino. Uh, Charles Gasparino, thanks for talking to Reason. Anytime. My pleasure. Okay. Huge so the- fan, just so you know, this is like a high watermark for me. I'm, I'm, I actually read Reason. I know some okay. people might say they do, but I actually read and I listen to your podcasts too. That is called your uh, work in the refs before we even begin. But uh, in on page 75 of Go Woke, Go Broke, uh, you say how a bunch of rich dudes became obsessed with the most leftist and radical interpretation of current events is really the central question I try to answer in Go Woke, Go Broke. Let's unpack that a little bit. What are you talking about? when you know when you talk about wokeness in the in the c-suite in america well i mean the current iteration is the sort of uh the the manifestation of all that occurred before i know i'm starting to sound like uh, kamala harris there for yeah. a minute, but, but, we, we are <laughs> well we are burdened by the past whether yes. it the is current, undone current, or done the, the yeah. current, it was burdened very much by the past but you know we got to a point where people were drinking beer and being proselytized about gender identity for, you know, in their favorite beer, people were sharp shopping for discounts at, at clothing at, at stores, you know, the, the average American people um, and with their kids and they were, you know, seeing, you know, sort of displays of gender identity that, you know, that involved children that they didn't want to expose their children to. And this is not at some, you know, shop on 42nd Street. This is at a place called Target. Right. Um, uh, people, you know, we call it Target. Target. We used to call it Target, to too. A, I've been give shy. a little bit of heft, yeah. First time I went to a Target was in 1989 in Dallas, Texas. And I asked, where can I get cheap sneakers? Because I was a poor intern at the Dallas Morning News. And I said, go to Target. Um, and so, uh, and you can get cheap sneakers there. Uh, so that's kind of what I thought, you know, so that's what was happening. That on top of people going to, the movies, see cartoons mm-hmm. with kids, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you know, two two people of the same sex start kissing each other. Um, none of this bothers me. I, I want to make that clear. I don't have this visceral reaction to that, mm-hmm. but a lot of people do. And yeah. you know, there was a consumer backlash against this that I thought was interesting from a journalistic standpoint. You know, what made companies go this way. What made Disney, Disney is a company, its headquarters is in Burbank, It's but its de facto headquarters is in Florida, gets a lot of tax breaks from the Florida government. There's a governor named Ron DeSantis who's very popularly elected, a legislature that is, you know, that is voted into office. Right. What makes Disney say a law that, that the, most of the people support in Florida is reprehensible and needs to be changed. And we're going to use our lobbying might to change it because we believe children should be taught. And this, if I may, this is after DeSantis had done Disney's bidding Oh yeah, when he wrote in a uh, social media law where he exempted uh, companies. It, it was specifically targeted to exempt Disney yes. from certain types of things. That that law was oh, uh, yeah. you know, was held in a Lots of stuff. But, they were, they were, it was like, what made this happen? And, you know, I, you know, it's more than just, you know, one story. I mean, and I try to, what I try to do is go back in time and use my own experience covering, I've been covering 
Wall Street for years. I've been covering the, the confluence of finance and Wall Street for years um, and all different types of finance. My first job as a cub reporter at the Wall Street Journal was covering the mutual fund business. As much as I hated it at the time, it was a great education. And I remember covering something known as socially responsible investing. People were right. throwing all their money in tech stocks, but there was a side thing where you know, these company, these asset managers would, you know, buy stocks based on what they felt was socially responsible. And it was always stuff that was, you know, better, you know, defined as progressive. I mean, it was, you know, people that yeah, it, it, Smith and Wesson or something. Yeah, never like, you, know, you, sell guns, you sell gun stocks, you buy, yeah. comp, you know, companies that believe in reproductive rights, mm -hmm. you know, you know, now, you buy if, if I may, before I, I, I let's, well, we'll talk first about Budweiser or Anheuser-Busch, sure. but you definitely come out of the school of thought and that, you know, that most uh, kind of famously articulated by Milton Friedman, Absolutely. you know, that the only, uh, you know, the only responsibility that a company has to its shareholders is to increase their value. Well, remember, Milton Friedman did say this. I don't want to put words yeah. in his mouth, but he also said do it within the sort of boundaries of ethics and legality. He, right. he, he added yeah. that part in there. You know, For we sure. don't. Obviously, you don't want GE polluting the Hudson River wantonly. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Not looking. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that should be the primary focus. I mean, that's what CEOs do good. They try to enhance shareholder value. They try to employ people. Mm -hmm. If they did something else, if they if they get into politics, they'd fuck it up. And yeah. you know, Milton Friedman knew that. It's it's so obvious that they that that has been Although what went on here. True also that companies have, you know, there's a reason why they do charity. There's a reason why they yes. give, you know, they bring vets in to do things and stuff like that. So, I mean, I, you know, I don't disagree at all with what you're saying about it. And in 2005, Reason had a great debate between John Mackey of Whole Foods, Milton Friedman, and TJ oh, yeah. Rogers, the old CEO, uh, semiconductor, uh, Cypress Semiconductor. CEO, who was famous, as you'll recall, or some of our listeners might not, uh, he stared down a bunch of nuns who said he wasn't doing enough socially responsible <laughs> work. And he said, like, sisters, get out of here. You've never created a job in your life and chewed them out uh, in the pages of the Wall Street Journal. Um, but it, it's interesting because part of being a good corporate citizen is oftentimes is doing charity work or being a good citizen, right? So yeah, I mean, it is, is yeah. But that's the that that's not your main job, and that's right. not part of your job. That's part. That's you know, that's the fruits of your labor should go into giving back a little bit. I get that. And by the way, there's a great there's this the, the hero of the book is a guy named Ed Renzi. He was in many ways the hero, but you know, he's he's the foil for the woke CEOs, yeah. and he was the former head of McDonald's USA that told me about like how they approached real social, how they approach real woke capitalism at, at mm -hmm. McDonald's. And it was fascinating. I didn't know all this, but I, and I went back and it's, you know, I did yeah. research on it and it's true. You know, you know, Ray Kroc, who is the creator of the modern McDonald's is known as some sort of, you know, he's regarded as some sort of ruthless capitalist who right. makes shitty hamburgers and, you know, fake shakes, chocolate shakes. But he really, you know, created this great business and he really opened it up to the inner cities and to, and to have African-Americans um, right. manage the stores in the inner cities. And, you know, he didn't do it through DEI. He did it because, you know, you know, let, let's let's let, let's try to let the free market work where it should work. Let's you do this in a free market way. And actually, Renzi had an argument with with Milton Friedman. It's it's an anecdote in the book where he said, listen, we're all about doing good. We we want to get black people to own. We want to help black people to own franchises like we're not going to give away money, but right. we want people to own it in and operate in black neighborhoods and employ and, and, and give back to the community that way. And Friedman uh, kind of like didn't really get what he was saying. You could read it, the anecdote of the book. But I, I think that's that, that's what most of us believe is the way this should go. Yeah. It took a different turn, though. It took a, a aggressively political turn. Well, let's it, let's talk about that in the context of Budweiser, you know, and the, the well, Bud Light catastrophe with Dylan Mulvaney, right. uh, the, the trans influencer who became a real flashpoint a couple of years ago. Um, but you take it back before that. Um, explain Anheuser-Busch and who owns them. And I mean, on a certain level, this and this is one of the things I find interesting, both about your book, but about these stories. 
you know, you think of Anheuser-Busch uh, as, you know, the ultimate American beer, even though it's got a kind of, you know, Czech German name to it and all of that. Yeah. And it's in St. Louis. Right. Um, but they kind of peaked as a beer company in something like 2008, right? In terms yeah, so, of selling. So, I mean, listen, there's never one reason why anything happens, as you know. Um, the, the old Anheuser-Busch was owned by the, the Bush family. And, um, you know, I actually, I went to University of Missouri. I remember one of the, my, you know, we used to have some fun every now and then. We were in the middle of the cornfields, bored out of our wits yeah. that we'd go to St. Louis, go to the Hill, which was the Italian neighborhood, eat some good spaghetti and meatballs. And then we'd go to the Anheuser-Busch factory plant and drink beer for free. Right. Go on a tour. It, it was, you know, America writ large, and it was. I uh, I will uh, match that with a story of my own. I went to that uh, back in the day. This was in the late nineteen eighties, and they put us after the tour. They put all of us in a room with every Anheuser Busch beer product, including yes. King Cobra malt liquor on tap. And it was back in the heyday of Eagle Brand snacks, so it was like premium, you know the sugar covered uh, cashews and you had seven minutes to drink as much as you wanted. As <laughs> I you kind of remember that. that. Was that was when I was there in the late and 80s. I do kind of remember that. And so it, was, it, it, it all ended in kind of like a flash, like the end of uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And then you're in an alley <laughs> somewhere in St. Louis after all. But, but it was yeah. it was like it was so cool. So I, I kind of know the company. I went to school in Mizzou at Mizzou and, you know, I got to know it. Um, the company was that way for many years. And then at some point they sell themselves, you know, the, the and, and it, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, you reminded me in the book, they were not just like a middle American company, uh, but they had a series of unbelievably um, archetypal advertising. Campaign. Iconic. Yeah. I mean, if you're, a, if you're a man, uh, you know, um, particularly, I, you know, I don't want to be uh I mean, this is this was a, this was a brand that was tailored to straight guys. You know what I'm yeah. going to say? Spuds McKenzie trying to pick up, the, you know, the cute dog picking up the girls in the bikinis. Um, it was also a very patriotic company. I still cry when I go back and I look at their. They had a great advertisement right after 9/11 of the Clydesdale taking a knee in front mm -hmm. of the Trade Center. I mean, it was just riveting and you know beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was. You know, you know, ads that were much more inclusive about America. I mean, it it was, you know, it was it was just a, a company that celebrated essentially our not our differences, but our you know right. our commonality. And I and that's that's what and they 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 built that brand for years. Mm -hmm. um, so then they're bought in two thousand after the financial crisis, I believe it was for like fifty billion dollars. I can't remember. It was a huge it was a huge amount of money, right. and you could see why the family wanted to sell. It was at the top. They sold to this sort of uh, this conglomerate, this beer conglomerate, a InBev. It's now known as a AB as an Anheuser Busch InBev, mm -hmm. and the culture changed dramatically. And it, it changed dramatically because you know these sort of multinational co corporations. The, the InBev was owned by Brazilians and you know run by Brazilians and Belgians. Uh, you know, uh, big Davos crowd. You know, mm -hmm. they started adopting the ethos of the Davos. And what I found in the book, because people are always saying, how did they get to Dylan Mulvaney? How bizarre was that? I mean, and what struck me as odd and someone who's been covering, you know, finance and companies for a long time, the company tried to pin it on like wayward marketing executives. There's a woman and a guy that I mentioned in the book, uh, Daniel Blake, the head of Budweiser's uh, Anheuser-Busch's marketing department and, and Alyssa Heinerscheid, who, who ran the uh, – who ran the brand it was the marketing chief on the brand, Bud Light. And they try to blame it all on her. And, you know, she had the unfortunate situation where she was talking about how she wanted to make the Budweiser brand less fratty and less, right. you know, much more inclusive. And then lo and behold, Dylan Mulvaney pops up and it goes viral and people. Like, and, and again, it is worth pointing out that beer sales in general have been going down for a long time. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, and all of the juice is to the extent that it there's any juice left in beer. Um, it's in artisanal brands. It's in, you know, home or uh, small batch, this type of stuff. But I mean, her, her, her instincts were kind of right. And by the way, we should point out that Lisa Heinerscheid is an excellent marketer. Mm -hmm. You know, I went back and looked, she, she did that, um, that game of Thrones ad. 
mm-hmm. she was responsible for in, in the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. It was a very artistic. I mean, got incredible reviews. She did the Miles Teller ad in the last in the Super Bowl. I think uh, not this one, the one before that. I mean, this, this woman knows what she's doing. She she's smart. So you, I I. I Try to ask people what makes someone this smart do something so unbrand. You get the the notion where you want to expand the pie, but you know how many trans beer drinkers are there, and you know what is the sort of notion that gets you, that makes you go there with someone like Dylan Mulvaney, who you know let's be frank. I mean, Dylan Mulvaney is not exactly a nobody. She at the time she was hired by 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 Anheuser-Busch and AB InBev, you know, she was maybe the top trans influencer in the country. She mm-hmm. chronicled her transition to man from man to woman, you know, on TikTok. She interviewed President Biden. She was doing lots of media. I mean, you're going to pick someone of that, of, the, of that gender, speci- that specific gender categorization, you know, she's it. Um, but what made her go there? That's something that was really off brand. I mean, there's ways to expand the pie where you don't have to go there and just totally alienate your, um, you know, your, because still a lot of construction workers and cowboys mm-hmm. are drinking Budweiser. How do you do that? And the, what I found out is that it wasn't just that she's woke. It started from the top. They were imposing DEI on their influencers. So and what I, what does that mean? You know, diversity, equity, inclusion in a company like you know AB InBev. Um, that means you have to have a certain amount of your influencers, your employees, right? They you have to you have to essentially give extra points to people that 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 meet a certain intersectionality of race and gender, and 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 over and hire them over others. And, you know, it doesn't matter if it makes business sense or not. I mean, Disney has a great, there's a great, you, you probably, I'm, I'm sure you've read this. There's this great sort of thing, a document I came across at Disney on like the sort of DEI, how it imposed DEI in hiring, you know, 50% have to be this, 50% have to be that 50%. And it's, it's never white men, just so you know, <laughs> right. it's just, you know, the, 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 it went all the way down from, Actors and actresses, cartoon characters in its movies to showrunners and, you know, bookers and right. people working at the company. And so that that sort of mindset is what forced what caused uh, Dylan Mulvaney to show up in a Budweiser. Uh, and one of the things in that uh, and you, you go into a lot of detail and reporting on the Dylan Mulvaney case, because one of the things that's interesting you know, uh, uh, William Calley, I mean, just to jump registers quite a bit here, William Calley recently died. The, uh, you know, the Eli Vietnam soldier who was, yeah, Eli. who was, had Millet, uh, attack, you know, attached to him. There was always that question of, well, he obviously didn't order it. What's going on here? I mean, you could not, nobody at AB InBev really copped to saying, I did this, right? Nobody. Um, which Anybody. is a sign that it's, there's, there's something, it, it goes higher. If, well, they, and not, not only that, they tried to pin it all on her and, and this guy, yeah. Daniel Blake, as, you know, him not paying attention and her just being totally woke. And th- that's not what I found. I found that there were pressures from above to do certain things. And I, and I explained how, you know, wokeness started at the top. Michelle Ducaris, you know, th- th- there's examples of, of him talking about ESG and, other and, and you know certain diversity issues in you know in, in terms of how he runs his company. I mean, we I document it and it, it filtered down to the influencers. Um, it, and it was really interesting, just how flat. You know, one of the, the things about covering business is just how dumb these businesses are when they get involved in politics. Like they just don't really get it, and it 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 always blows up in their face and i think as a journalist i can't help it but saying this but you know while i'm tr- writing about a serious subject it, it was fun writing this book cuz they literally kept stepping on their dick at every single step of the way are they, and you could oh, show it <laughs> you know head of inbev and you you kind of talk about this as a you know as a dumb company that's an old uh style kind of vertical you know or it's just a conglomerate yeah. where they they know everything and they just keep buying more stuff and then trying to cut costs but they you know they don't really understand the businesses that they're taking over 
do they justify it in terms of saying this is going to grow the market or do they justify it by saying the market will not address this type of issue so we have to force it do, well did I mean, you ever find any clarity on that not really i mean listen dei and wokeness in general is part of the corporate culture there so once it's in there it's kind of hard to 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 weed out you know what i'm saying it permeates hiring it permeates just about every decision they make i mean he actually said it esg is part of everything we do ducur is the the ceo yeah. um i think on top of that when you have cost pressures it becomes interesting because then you know instead of doing ads i mean i think if dylan mulvaney wasn't a national ad we should point out you know what right. i'm saying it, it, i mean it was basically a single can of bud light uh, well, that she used that. it was it was but, a couple it was a couple spots yeah. on social media which right. companies like like ab and bev are turning to more because it's cheap so if it was like a big ad rollout they would have shown it at their um at their yearly distributor conference, the distributors would have went absolutely ballistic, right? Yeah. Um, and you know that would have been that. <laughs> so, but they didn't. It was part of this whole thing. They're doing more and more of this because it's cheap and it saves money, and they don't have the money for marketing because they're because it's a big company. They got a lot of debt. You know, they buy all these things and they skimped on the marketing. So that that's one aspect of it. But clearly, the other aspect of it is when you skimp on certain things, you know, you generally, what I always find interesting, they don't, these companies don't skimp on wokeness. What, what I found yeah. fascinating, so I began the book, it wasn't a book that was sweeping. It was a book, it was began with one thing. I was covering the regional banking crisis and Silicon Valley Bank was going under. If you notice, it's it's three or four, maybe five pages in the whole book, but it was initially the whole book until I realized it was much bigger. But I, my, what drove me into Silicon Valley Bank is not only where these guys taking all sorts of risk and cutting corners on on ma risk management. Right. They weren't cutting corners on wokeness. They were doing DEI sessions. They were embracing ESG. You know, they they were nominally regulated by the the Fed of San Francisco, where the head of San Fred of San Francisco was celebrating Black Lives Matter in 2020. Mm -hmm. And literally, as they were doing all this stuff, their balance sheet was imploding. That right. and and you know, it is interesting that. When it comes time to cost cut, these companies don't cost cut the wokeness out. They are doing it now. If you notice, right. TEI departments now are going away because they're saving money. And you know, well, and the, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, was also frustrating. From a if if you're a free market, I don't want to call myself a free market fundamentalist uh, because I you know that has a bad varnish uh, or taste to it, but. I'm pretty close to that. And what was particularly maddening there is that a number of people who consider themselves super free market were like, well, other banks could fail, but this bank, which I happen to be part of, or it's in, in Silicon Valley, well, uh, it really needs to be bailed out. Yeah, I know. It was ridiculous. I mean, and they were bailed out because, you know, I mean, the Biden administration came in, arranged a bailout. I think JP Morgan bought some stuff. I mean, there was a bunch, it was a bunch of banks that stepped in. I can't remember which one stepped in to buy their, their liabilities, but I mean, it, it, they did it with, with government backstops, which I, right. which, you know, it just, it just perverts the whole system. I mean, you know, one thing you, you don't want to create, which I think and this was going to be the book is something known as moral hazard, where you just keep mm -hmm. taking these untold risks because government comes in and bails you out. Fed right. lowers interest rates. You know, you get the TARP bail. I, when I was at yeah. CNBC, funny, one of my biggest stories at CNBC when I was there, and I covered the financial crisis like minute by minute, when I broke the TARP story, the, the actual bailout of the financial markets, everybody's like, wow, that's great. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. They're going to bail out the banks. You know, markets up within five minutes of me reporting this market was up 500 points. And I just realized that yeah, but is that good for society, bailing out these assholes that yeah. fucked everything up? And we should point out, it didn't stop the markets from further creating tanking because there was yeah. still other stuff in the system. And then they bailed them out again when the Fed started printing money. Oh, and going back to the beginning of this century, I mean, every attempt to you know properly regulate the markets end up giving them more money and it just intensifies the concentration of a few firms which then become too big to fail and it just kind of repeats it itself. Just, it just repeats itself so that was silicon valley that was my book on but it, as that was happening then budweiser came target yeah. came i was very close with larry fink over the years he was a source of mine he's some guy i actually admire him in many ways i i don't yeah i, I think i treated him very fairly in the book 
trying to point out both the good and the bad of where he went wrong with ESG. And w- what I found fascinating about him is that he kind of fesses up to it at the end, if you think about it. You know, I went too far. I should have just stuck with the the E and, you know, the transformational notion of a green economy and not, you know, got into the S and the G. And Let's the talk stuff. about uh, Larry Fink, BlackRock and ESG in a second to, to kind of cap this story with Budweiser. They... I, it's kind of fascinating that Modelo is now the best-selling beer in the country. And I think they're like, number three I, now. I think they're number three. They fell to oh, three. Really? Oh, okay. Five. Fair enough. So, um, but, you know, Budweiser is now trying to claw back. They have people like Dana White, the head of the yeah. UFC. Is is it, um, you know, is it successful? Is Anheuser's reorientation or is this more, you know, a way to understand it is that this is a great American company that sold something that was very popular, but, you know, kind of like a Sears Roebuck or an A&P. It's like, yeah, it's going to stick around for a while and it's going to it's going to have a lot of money involved, but it's like it's never really going to be a market leader. again. I, I just think I, I think they're done um, as a top selling beer. I mean, who knows what's going to happen in, in the future? I, I can just say this, that you know, they, they've been making the rounds. I, at the end of the book, I talk about how they're making the rounds and how they're trying to like tell selective measures of the, members of the media. Well, not me. They don't want to talk to me. I mean, I did run all my stuff. Just so you know, every bit of this book was vetted with the people. I actually showed them copy. You know, I was just yeah. that fastidious when it came to fact checking this thing. So if I got stuff wrong, it's, you know, it's not that I didn't try, you know what I'm saying? Right. To get it right. Um, you know, they were trying to they're trying to say this is just one influencer downplay. They, they never once apologized. I think the apology would have gone further than, you know, I, I spoke with Dana White about about it. You know, they're, they're paying him a lot of money, basically, the yeah. UFC. They're gone. And, and, you know, as part of that whole thing, they actually cut a deal. Anheuser-Busch actually cut a deal with Dana's other business, something called Power Slap. Do you ever see this? It's two, yes. two big guys standing, literally slapping each other until one falls down and gets knocked out. Right. I think so, it's like a Russian sport or something. Think, well, yeah. Dana, the way Dana described it to me, it was it, big in Appalachia and big in Brazil and maybe Russia too. But he yeah. said he thinks it's going to be bigger than the UFC. And and Budweiser, wanted, they're, they're going to do something. They, they, there was plans to do something with Power Slap. Is maybe not do Bud, but another AB, another Anheuser Busch brand. But I'm just saying to myself, maybe a Killian's uh, Red or something. Yeah, I, don't, maybe, I don't even know if that's a Bud beer, but I don't know Kieran no. beer, right? That, yeah. I think that is a Bud beer, the Japanese one. Uh, but what was interesting Nick, is that if you think about it, they went from Dylan Mulvaney giggling right. in a fake woman's accent in a bubble bath. To two big dudes slapping each other, right. that never works. It's too yeah. absurd. And I think what they probably should have done is say, "Listen, we fucked up." They've never said this, you know. Right after this whole thing blew up, there in their first public commentary, you know, instead of saying, "I'm sorry," you know, um, uh, Brendan Whitworth, who's the the CEO, of, he, he reports to Ducuris, but he's sort of the figurehead CEO of Anheuser Busch went on, I think, CBS Morning News to explain how, you know, they, they how much money they give to the trans community, which, you know, in of itself is fine. I have no problem with that. But that is not the message that his, his, his customers wanted to hear. You know, they wanted to hear, we're out of the politics business. We're sorry. You know, we're going to we're going to do advertising with horses and, you know, whatever. If it does mean anything, Kid Rock, who, you know, famously yes. shot a right. bunch of cans of Bud Light with a semi-automatic weapon, um, drank a beer and said that, you know, Jesus forgave. He drank a beer on Joe Rogan, a Bud Light, and talked about how Jesus forgives people. And he is kind of like the Jesus of Bud well, Light. So well, it's forgiven. interesting you bring that up because the end of the book talks about that. He he spoke to Tucker Carlson saying, you know, yeah. I forgive him. Should we? You know, what's interesting is the Trump connection here. It's very fascinating. Don Jr., is friends with um, Brendan Whitworth, I believe. And, you know, Don Jr. came to his defense in, in 2020, in 2023, they saying we shouldn't, you know, flush an entire company down. It's mainly Republican. You know, they, they give to a lot of Republican causes, they give to a lot of vet causes. We should just because there's one woke person at the company. And, you know, as you know, the, the Trumps are close with Kid Rock and everything. And, right. and you know, there is, 
I, there is some, there, there is an interesting connection there, friendship connection. If, you know, Brendan Whitworth, you know, dealing with Dana White, who's also kind of close with the the Trump, the Trump people. A lot of this is friendship. And, and yes, Dana, Brendan Whitworth ran AB InBev, you know, in terms of campaign contributions, much, you know, he, they gave mostly to Republican causes, apparently. Um, yeah. But none of that worked. You know, because right. I, I just don't think you can put the genie back in the bottle here. And they never you, apologized. Is the problem, you know, I mean, that companies um, start creating a uh, politics around their brands, or is it that people increasingly are conscious consumers so that they, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, that that it's it's not simply the company imbuing products with you know, a meaning. It's also consumers because part of the response, like if this was an attempt to use online influencers to, you know, grow market share, or bring your product into new audiences, there's also a response, right? Where you, you know, there are probably 15 or 20 right wing influencers who can really start a rolling wave that's probably going to swamp most companies if they want. Well, I think it's, it's, listen, I, I just don't think most people are woke. I, I just don't think that. And I, I think with national broad brands, if you want to be get into business, I interviewed a, a bunch of marketing experts in here. Um, there's one guy, David Evans, he, he does this type of marketing. And he says these companies go way too far because they think just because they embrace, they, they think all, they think Latinos are all one race. Right. When they're not, you know, and they're yeah. not all politically left wing, you know, they're not all politically, they, they, there's, they, there's all these gradations that are not uh, appreciated when you when you go when you do woke marketing and you know I I quoted BlackRock we're going to get into BlackRock the yeah. big asset management firm had it 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 sort of t it, I had these documents where it coached its people how to sell to different ethnicities um, if you're a black person remember black people act like this if you're you know if you're if, if dealing with the LGBTQ community remember it's you know, they might not trust you. I mean, it was all this weird virtue signaling and most people just aren't like this, you know? And right. I think if you're going to piss off a lot of people, you you can't, you got to do it with a specific brand. I think Ben and Jerry's is a perfect example. Yeah. Now, explain that because they, they help pioneer socially conscious right. uh, consumption, right? Because yeah. their, their stuff was more expensive. It was also higher quality, but it also like, it literally put the politics on the, you know, the package on, on the package. And by the way, it's, it's, it's a, it's a niche product. Yeah. So you can do that. You know what I'm saying? I don't think you could do that at target. You got too much, too many people, too many middle Americans who don't want to be proselytized while they shop. I mean, some of this is just common sense. I mean, do you want to, yeah. I mean, when you drink a beer, do you want to be virtue signaled? I mean, you know, do you want people, to, some 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 uh, salesman from BlackRock, to treat you a certain way because you're a white guy, as opposed to? I mean, it, yeah. it gets like it gets it gets absurd, and and I think that's what the book tried to, tried to show. There's a, it, I tried to write it in a funny way because mm -hmm. some of this is funny and absurd. Yeah. It's the theater well, let, let's talk about Disney because um, that's another big example of a company. You know, Disney like Anheuser Busch is about as American as it can get, right? It's as American as uh, apple pie. It went through a phase, and this is one of the other things, you know, hovering over your uh, over your book to me is, well, sometimes brands just die. Like it, it amazes me that companies like Ford and GM and IBM at this point are still around because most corporations don't last, you know, 10 years, much less a hundred plus years. They innovated, um, they innovated out of their, out of, in a lot of yeah. those cases. I mean, yeah, no, and I mean, Disney, I can remember, I guess it was in the eighties, maybe even the early nineties. Disney was one of the great examples of how American companies just couldn't compete anymore. It had been great and it was thrown out movies like, uh, you know, the black hole. And I mean, it was over. And then, right. It's animation studios came back in a big way in the late 80s. And now, it, it you know, it became this total, you know, uh, uh, death star in the entertainment world. It controls everything, including the Star Wars universe. What's going on at Disney and where did they, you know, where did the wokeness at Disney go, uh, come from? Well, I mean, listen, it's it's a Hollywood company, so it's always going to be left of center to some a certain extent in their in their, you know, political, I guess, leanings. Uh, but they serve middle America, 
you know, and when I say middle America, I mean, they serve working class, white people, black people, Latino people, you know, they serve the middle class. That's who consumes their products. That's who goes to their parks. And I can go up and down. Um, So and they and while their their headquarters is at um, in, in Burbank, their real headquarters is Florida, which is one of the bluest, the reddest states you you have right now. Um, Michael Eisner kind of created the modern Disney, the conglomerate. Okay. Um, I know Bob Iger gets a lot of credit for, you know, having a great run, which he did. He, he took a lot of what Eisner did and sort of retrofitted it and, and went very far left in programming and, and in, in terms of corporate management. But Eisner created this conglomerate, you know, he bought ESPN through eight when he bought ABC and he created this entertainment conglomerate that was huge. And, you know, and, and, and sort of all encompassing and something that was, you know, struck right at the mid, into middle America's uh, tastes. And it, it, and it didn't offend, you know, Pocahontas does not offend. The Lion King doesn't. Well, well, you know, it's funny you, you say Pocahontas because I can remember when Pocahontas was coming out, a ton of right wing conservatives before the movie had been released were attacking it for, you know, throwing, uh, you know, kind of English explorers under the bus. So, it, I mean, it was interesting in the early I mean, 90s. Yeah, was, I remember that, too. But it I mean, was, you know, it was like, no, Disney was a dangerously left wing company. Like, oh, blah, yeah, blah, they, blah. They, no. they were. I mean, you know, they, they, they bought Miramax, which was pub- peddling smut. I can remember, you know, right wingers, their heads exploding with Pulp Fiction, which was a Miramax movie, which one was the great, owned one of the great by ones Disney. Ever. What are yeah, like what's going on? So yeah, I mean, you know, that, that's why I'm not a right winger, I guess. You can yeah. Say, yeah, because I actually like those movies. Um, but so, you, but you talk about Iger and his successor kind of getting trapped, like where they're well, way, Iger, they Iger, way ahead of Iger the, gets uh, blown uh, out at some point. You know, he was a difficult guy to work with. I, I address it in the book. Then his successor is. Um, Eisner gets blown out. His successor is Bob Iger, right. who takes politics in, and basically puts it in, in, in the boardroom in a much more overt way. And he was able to get away with it a lot because I think Disney was riding, riding the wave of, of just, you know, the, the media was at a sweet spot, particularly that type of media is pre-streaming. People were going to movies. Yeah. It was producing some hits. I mean, I mean, he was able to get away with it in ways that when he left, the minute he left, he couldn't. So right. he hands over the company, a very woke company by 2022, to a guy that probably had no business running the company just from an operational standpoint. He just didn't know Hollywood. Bob, his name was Bob Chapek. You know, you just people still wonder, how did he get the job? You know, right. he wasn't a movie guy. He wasn't a talent guy. He was an operations guy. He actually knew how to, like, a balance. He understood a balance sheet, but just wasn't good with people. It was just, it was, it was an odd choice, particularly someone like Iger, who was like a very sort of aff, you know, at least superficially affable guy. And some guy that was always dealing with wall street and wall street loved them because mm-hmm. their profits went up every year. Um, so he hands it to this guy and then he hands it to this guy. He hands a very well company, but a very financially distressed company. I think people mm-hmm. forgot what was going on in 2021, 2020 with Disney you know, the, the theme parks were shut down after COVID, but you know, more than that, people weren't going to movies as much anymore. You know, yeah. we had streaming. They started a streaming service that was, you know, it, streaming is a difficult um, yeah. sort of, it's a huge lift. Nobody, right? nobody seems to be making money on uh, it. Uh, Netflix and nobody else, right? Yeah. And um, ESPN, which they owned, was, you know, people are getting out of cable and ESPN cord, is you have, you yeah. have cord cutting. So people are not looking at the cables or watching the cables. At the stuff. same time, if I may also that, you know, places like major league baseball and the NFL are clawing back more of their programming Absolutely. into their own channel. So it's like kind of a perfect hold, storm, of yeah, a and lot I, of debt and everything's going south. So the debt came because, you know, Iger at the end of his tenure, buys 21st century fox's entertainment assets which in my view was one of the greatest sales of all time by the guy who sold it namely rupert murdoch yeah. just proves his brilliance of understanding markets and tops of markets 
He's been around a long time and he's still doing great. I mean, that deal tells yeah. you is proof positive. How, and I'm not just saying it because he employs me. I don't you know, barely know <laughs> the guy. But just so you know, if I'm, I'm the outside looking in, that was one yeah. hell of a deal. And it was a one hell of a bad deal for Disney because it got laid in with it saddled with all this debt. Right. So Chapek is sitting there with all this stuff right going on. He, and then on top of it, he wants to de the company. He, he knows that, you know, again, his audience is not, you know, the typical white liberal woman from Manhattan. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it isn't even a, 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 it isn't a Twitterverse. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? It's not an activist. It's a guy, a woman, a man, generally a man and a woman with kids yeah. who just want to take their kid, you know, just want to enjoy stuff. And, you know, he so he he made this effort. He was telling people, and because I, I spoke with the people, he wanted to figure out a way. You know, if and one guy said, you know, Iger, if Iger had his way, there would be three same sex kissing scenes in a cartoon. Right. If Chapek had his way, he'd cut it down to one and maybe try to figure out a way to get it out of it totally. And so that's what he did. And he had a good relationship initially with Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor. Mm-hmm. So all this is happening, um, and then the Florida gets right in the middle of the culture wars. Ron DeSantis, who knows how to press buttons, uh, and the state legislature, they pass um, a bill that basically says you can't teach sex sex ed to kids, okay? You have to wait and, and preclude certain types of issues that can be discussed. The left brands it the don't say gay bill, even though it doesn't really say gay in the bill. Um, and um, Iger is now on the sidelines and Apparently, he's not crazy about Chapek. They have this whole back office feud, and I get into a little bit of that. Yeah. And he dings him. He says, you know, I can't understand what my predecessor said. You got to check the exact quote. I'm paraphrasing. hasn't said anything about this, but this is a horrible law. It's bad for kids. You know, LGBTQ TQ plus kids are, you know, they're going to be discriminated against here. And it started this thing where Chapek got under a lot of pressure to oppose a law that most people in Florida want it. Uh, and a lot of people don't see it as being that bad of a thing. I mean, I, I personally, again, I'm a, I'm pretty liberal when it comes to this personally, but I, I, I've talked to parents about this and they, you know, they're not crazy about it, you know, teaching yeah. kids pronouns and, you know, in, in, inter, you know, sex between two, two guys, it's changes. And, you know, they, they, they kind of want to deal with that on their own. That's what parents want to do. So, um, Chapek's first instinct was to stay out of it. it. And then Iger made the tweet and then it became unbearable where he did a 180. And as he did the 180, you know, he went to war with DeSantis and it, it just, it, it just exposed the company for what it, for what Iger made it to be. But then it, I, you know, I, I agree. I mean, there was a huge political backlash, um, by the same token, like people were talking about how Disney was a groomer company, works for groomers. Like, where does that come from? How does that figure into it? Well, I mean, that's social media. You know, I, I actually quoted some people at Disney on this, and they were like, you know, how can we be a groomer company if you saw the Bud Lightyear scene that got so much publicity, yeah. right? The same-sex kissing scene. Like, if you blinked, you missed it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, I, I just think they, they might have went too far – at the parks and, yeah. and, and, and some of these scenes, I guess, you know, my point to them was, well, why'd you need it? You know, it was like, you know, did you really need, you know, that same sex kissing scene? It, it seemed gratuitous to me. It seemed like it's flicked in there. And, and it was, it was gratuitously flicked in to, you know, satisfy some, some, um, some DEI requirement. And they actually had, they actually, Chris Rufo, who's been doing a great job on, you know, uncovering corporate wokeness uh, actually had, you know, one of the one of the sort of executives at Disney talking about how she instills queerness into movies whenever she can into cartoons. It's part of what she I mean, she said those are exact words. Um, and I think at the parks, the greet, the trans greeters at the parks, I think some of this became much, you know, listen, again. Trans people are our friends. They, they they work with us. They're our colleagues. No one's saying they, they shouldn't have jobs. I mean, that's, I mean, some of this stepped the line to proselytizing. And I think that's where they went wrong. And it wasn't just on that. It was on political messaging, you know, on, on a whole host of issues. And I think that's, 
you know, where Disney went wrong. And I think now yeah. they're trying, as the end of the book shows, they're trying to put the genie back in the bottle a lot. Right. Trying to not Well, be- they're lucky Inside Out 2, the most recent Pixar uh, release, is like one of the, or the top grossing movie that they've had in forever. So, I mean, our companies like Disney, and this might be a little bit different than, uh, than a Budweiser, are they you know, two or three hits in a row away from people being like, okay, all is forgiven. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, this, they would have gotten it by now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I, I think, I think, it, I, I think we're, I, I think they, the, the, I really think the damage is done. Mm-hmm. I think the, the spectacle of, you know, how you built up to 2020 and the spectacle of corporate yeah. life post 2020, where it was wokeism on steroids has just left such a bad taste in people's mouth. I mean, just people just annoyed. That doesn't mean they will never go to a movie again. It right. doesn't mean they'll never, you know, go to Disney World again. I, I do. Th- it's kind of interesting to think about these, you know, if you think about movie theaters, you know, for about 100 years, 110 years, they have been a fundamental part of everyday entertainment for the masses. That was going away. I mean, you know, ticket sales have been dropping for oh, decades yeah. before all of this. So, in a lot of to- in a lot of ways, this these may be the things that finally kneecap industries, but it tends to happen in industries that are already kind of declining. Right? You know, I spoke at length with Mark Cuban mm-hmm. in the book, the tech entrepreneur, billionaire owner of. Yeah. The uh, well, until recently, I guess the Dallas Mavericks, right, um, and also a, a theater chain as well, like yes. a, a Lux theater chain. Yeah. And, and Mark is a Democrat, you know, yep. a big anti-Trumper. He told me that wokeness sells, and you know, there's a whole section of the book where he rattles off all the the woke stuff that sells. You know, the NBA is is embraces wokeness, and they do really great. Um, so does soccer. Um, uh, and look at what football did. And, you know, what it misses is the NBA doesn't – is big, but it's not that big. Football, maybe, but football had a backlash the minute they went totally woke with one knee. I mean, people stopped going. They had to stop it. You know, they had to start reading you – know, people had to stand for the national anthem. Um, I, I and, and he was trying to say, well, look at all these tech companies. They're all woke and they do the best. Well, that's like saying, you know, when I download my Reason podcast, I'm virtue signaling. You know, right. I downloaded on my I, Apple iPhone. Apple's a, a woke company, right. but I'm virtue saying, no, I'm not. I'm using Apple to listen to some non woke yeah. programming. I mean, just, uh, what so what do you make? Product. Are con- our companies going to, you know, there, there are various moments where people say, hey, I don't want to buy sweatshop goods. That was a big thing in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, and, and uh, companies like Nike had to clean up their supply chain or at least make it seem as if they did. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the NBA now, you know, they, on the one hand, they are like, okay, we're pro, uh, you know, George Floyd demonstrations and demonstrations for criminal justice reform, et cetera. But then when you say, Hey, you know what, maybe the NBA should do something to help the Uyghurs in China, LeBron James and other people shut that down immediately. Is is there going to be a permanently politicized consumption war going on? Um, or is it kind of like this will recede because- Well, it depends you know, like, on how- it, 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 it's, a, it, it's a legitimate question, and it, it depends on how hypocritical. I don't know how you justify ESG, environmental social governance yeah. investing, um, by, and say that, okay, you know, your corporate board has to be 50% you know, people of color or gender diversity- and not impose that on Chinese companies. Mm-hmm. And essentially, like, where is the people of, of um, you know, underserved communities in China? Right. The Uyghurs, who are not even underserved. They're, they're oppressed. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're under the wheel. Yeah. Yeah, they're under the wheel. They're, they're, it's, it's a near genocide, if you, mm-hmm. depending on what reports you're, you're dealing with. Right. Where is the Uyghur represented demanded on the in the diversity matrix? Why is you know Ron DeSantis made this point to uh, to um, to Chapek? If you're going to oppose this law, aren't people going to say, "Wow, you know, Disney does business in China, which persecutes the Uyghurs, you know, does all this bad stuff." But you know, you don't like some law in, in Florida about teaching sex ed to kids. 
you know, what is that? And I think the hypocrisy is the sort of one of the, the problems here. I mean, you know, these companies are overtly hypocritical. You know, they right. virtue signal, but they, you know, they, they also look to make a quick buck from some of the most, the worst players in the world. And yeah, let's talk about that in, uh, in uh, conjunction with BlackRock and ESG. Larry Fink, who you talked to, who's an interesting character. Yeah. Uh, it, tell us who BlackRock, what, what is BlackRock and what was their commitment to ESG? Well, a little background on BlackRock. BlackRock is called BlackRock because it used to be the money management subsidiary of Blackstone. Larry Fink is this fascinating guy. He was one of the creators and the, the sort of, I guess, geniuses behind the mortgage-backed security. Um, it was two people behind it. It was Lou Ranieri and, and Larry Fink. And in the 1980s, and by the way, Lou Ranieri was made famous by Michael Lewis's book, Liar's Poker. And it, depending on who you talk to, either the mortgage-backed security is a horrible, toxic waste instrument, or it helps people get 30-year loans, which it does, because no bank will make a 30-year loan if they can't offload the loan to a, a mortgage-backed, to a company that packages them into a mortgage-backed security. So Larry Fink, in I think 1986, 87, blows up. He's, he's the, the head guy of mortgage-backed securities at at Credit Suisse, uh, at first Boston, I'm sorry, blows up, almost tanks the firm. The firm gets bailed out by Credit Suisse, a big French bank. And he's on the street with his people and he gets a job, he gets an office with with um, with Blackstone, with Steve Schwartzman and Pete Peterson. And he creates a money management subsidiary. He's now a reformed guy that does not want to take big risks in the markets anymore. He was a trader back then, now he wants to be an investor. And he creates this amazing company called BlackRock, which eventually he spins out of out of there, gets outside investors, out of Blackstone, becomes its own company, and um, you know understands the investment business at some level. That that it's just remarkable that he went from zero assets to ten trillion, which is what they have today. Yeah. Um, something happened interesting at BlackRock in the, in in twenty sixteen. Larry Fink um, is. Or actually, before that, you know, um, Larry Fink is uh, often talked about being the Treasury Secretary for Obama, for Biden, for Hillary. Um, at the same time, you have 2008 happen, and there's this perfect storm. He wants to be Treasury Secretary. Wall Street after 2008 is in the middle of a populist sort of uprising, right? It was, you know, there was the Tea Party, but mainly the uh, the left with Occupy Wall Street. And that's when ESG starts kicking around and it starts becoming an issue where we could do good for society, Wall Street, if we impose, if we help shape behaviors. And one way to shape it is as an asset management, you tell the companies that you're buying, do X, Y, and Z according to these metrics. And he goes all in on ESG. And over the years, he becomes like not just a, a spokesman for it, he became the spokesman for it. And... And I traced that, like how it happened, how it manifested at the company, and then how it kind of blew up in his face. And I, I give him credit for talking to me and being honest about it. Yeah. Um, it, it was an odd transformation because I never knew him as to be a far lefty. He was always this moderate, you know, kind of progressive social. Is he, I mean, I guess this, this gets to the nub of a lot of questions about corporate wokeness. Is it done you know, out of a sense of ideological commitment where it's like, I know this is going to cost me money, but it's the right thing to do. Or is it, this is a way to make more money because in the end, doing, doing well mean, or doing good means doing well. I mean, listen, they, they justify it in a lot of different ways. Um, you have to look at it case by case, I believe. In the, in the case of Larry Fink and BlackRock, I think there was a business rationale there too. And it's always good to get patted on the back by the media, you know, go to the Andrew R. Sorkin uh, deal book conference. Oh, well, Larry, you're doing great making the world a better place. I mean, that, that feels good in front of all the people, the people, but you remember what, what went on, you know, after 2008. Um, so remember BlackRock invests money. It's on the buy side. It's an asset manager. You can buy funds through them as the individual, mm -hmm. but they also buy a lot of, uh, they also manage a lot of assets for big pension funds, New York state pension fund, California, mm -hmm. two of the biggest. As you know, these pension funds are run by politicians, often leftist, progressive mm -hmm. politicians. And they also began demanding ESG. So to, to, to sort of get that money, which is extremely lucrative, I mean, the New York City pension fund alone has 20, 
twenty billion dollars, I believe. Um, you can go down the line. I mean, the, the, the Calico Calpers has its multiples of that. And look what the New York State Pension Fund has multiples of that. The, there's a lot of money to be made by investing th- this money. And so if you are an asset manager and you go to a state legislature or the people who are buying these funds and you say, hey, I've got a fund that invests in every kind of pet progressive project you have, you're more likely to for them to say, OK, we're going with you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what he did. And, you know, and, you know, and and by the way, to be honest, the the they, they, it was almost demanded that these guys do this. Um, th- that they, that, uh, Larry, I mean, there's a scene in the book where Bla- Brad Lander, the control of New York city was one of the main players in the, in the city pension fund turns to him and says, you have to diver- basically tells me he has to divest from, from oil stocks. And, you know, even, yeah. even though BlackRock is big into ESG, you still you know, hold $260 billion of, of, of oil patch stocks. And Larry's like, okay, if I do that, you know, it's going to tank the markets, you know, you, you know, it's going to hurt your, and the guy was like, oh, I don't care. You know I mean? He just, yeah. really, I, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, the, these are ideologues that run these places that, that, that are in charge of people's money and how to appeal to them is kind of that also spurred ESG in a major way. There were people who um, wanted to virtue signal why they invest as well, average people, and there's a market there for that. Right. Uh, but you know, infusing ESG into everything is what it, what Larry Fink did into all its portfolios. I mean, I interviewed people about this. Was a concerted effort for a lot of reasons. They thought it made them money by getting the state pension funds. They thought it was politically wise. It got Elizabeth Warren off his back or you know, kept her at bay. Right. She's always uh, like looking to call. They're them. always looking to break up companies or put you more had, restrictions. You had both the Obama administration, uh, which was two terms, which was pretty progressive. You also had Biden administration now, which is pretty pro- progressive. But then Trump was interesting. What was interesting about Trump is that Trump and Larry Fink actually got along. It's like a whole, mm-hmm. there's a whole section in the book about that. They like each other. They were, they, you know, he managed Trump's money. So right. as far left as Larry was going, <laughs> Trump didn't Trump him at all. said from the podium, like, he made me a lot of money. He's a good yes, guy. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes. So, but you also have Larry Fink started to walk away or has walked away from me. Well, it, then it started costing him. Yeah. Money. It became this toxic political issue. A couple of things happened. I think, you know, peak wokeness ended in like 2023, as we know, with Budweiser. And it also ended in 2022, 23 for, for Larry Fink. Um, yeah. The company was, you know, th- those funds didn't do very well either, you know, for individuals. That's, that was another problem. Mm-hmm. And then it became a huge political issue. And, you know, what was interesting about this book is like, what, you know, who shined the light most I guess, most directly on Larry Fink, ESG, and his wokeness. And it was some kid, I call him a kid because he's in his 30s, probably in his, you know, his short pants. <laughs> his name is Will Hild. He runs something yeah. called Consumer Research, which, by the way, is very much connected with Leonard Leo and the, you know, former... The vast right-wing conspiracy. Yeah, uh, but I, I, I don't think it's that right-wing, right, wing, yeah. but, you know, that's right. what they would call it. And um, Will Hill did this amazing job, you know, framing the debate around Larry Fink, made him the boogeyman of ESG yeah. to the point that these other pension funds in red states. Now, we do remember red states are now growing in size and power, right? Texas, Florida, where are people leaving? They're leaving California for Texas, New York for Florida. Their pension funds are growing. They're much more powerful the whole South is growing in sort of economic power and might, and their pension funds are growing. They started to withdraw their funds from BlackRock and protest his ESG stuff. And it, a lot of it was because of Will Hilt. And, you know, I go through his, this this kid, I mean, diabolic, if you think he's diabolically brilliant. And I, I explained yeah. it. I spent a lot of time interviewing him. I explained his tactics. It was just I mean, how was, how is he so effective? I mean, you do a, a great job of documenting that. Um, he's a smart kid that kind of gets it. I mean, you know, you know. Listen, here's the thing, and also he had the economy moving in his favor when right. when he started his assault on Fink. I want to say it's around 2022, right? Um, we had something known as inflation for the first time that we've had in a yeah, long time, in, and uh, I talk about how time. that kind yeah. of grew out of this and. 
you could and that it. I mean the inflation and you are you know unambiguous in it that is a combination of uh, you know Trump era spending yes. as well as Biden era spending I mean it is a massive amount of money being pumped into the economy in a very short yeah, period. Yeah, it was bipartisan. And, yeah. and, you know, but and both, Biden, both in the fiscal supply as well as monetary supply. Well, it's Biden, just things did it, like Biden did it, did Trump on steroids on the spending. Yeah. There's no doubt yeah. about that. But Trump is hardly a you know, right. fiscal conservative, so to speak. But yeah. on top of that, you had you had a war in the Ukraine, which you know, limited gas supply. You had then you had a, a Democratic administration, Biden administration, not only you know, stoking inflation through spending and, you know, had the Fed keeping interest rates at zero. It was also cutting supply. I mean, you know, listen, the smart thing to do when you have inflation is to cut regulations, increase the supply side. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty simple. He did just the opposite of that. So you had this perfect storm where you had a war, which was limiting gas supply. You had ESG, which was limiting gas supply. You had inflation, and then you had even more inflation on top of it. ESG was a catalyst, I posit, in the book. And I and I think I'm on pretty solid ground. I spoke with a lot of economists that that was an extra helping of inflation on top of it all. Yeah. And, well, and also an unwillingness to call it what it was. I yes. mean, we kept well, being that talk, you know, the transitory nature of this inflation. Right. Tra- it's all transitory. transitory. Yeah. Joe Biden's yeah. not like asleep at the switch. I mean, you know, listen, this, yeah. this, this is just piling up. This is probably why Trump is going to win as crazy as he is. You just can't suspend this belief this much, this many times. Let's, um, you know, you you mentioned this earlier in our conversation. If there's a hero in the book, it's Ed Renzi, uh, the former CEO of McDonald's. He is also somebody who, even after he retired, he he talked to a bunch of other CEOs and things like that. Who is Ed Renzi and why is he a model in your book for somebody who has a social conscience and also then, you know, creates a great company, which has, for, you know, primary effects of bringing cheap food and good paying jobs to people, but then also has, you know, a s- social impact beyond just the, you know, the bottom line. Well, I always felt he had his heart in the right place. He wasn't virtue signaling. And by the way, so Ed Renzi is this kind of working class guy. He went to Ohio State, you know, during the 60s. He um, he worked from like the bottom of McDonald's and became the, the CEO. Ray Kroc ran it, but he was the CEO of McDonald's America. And, you know, he was a kind of a transformational f- figure in McDonald's mm-hmm. in, in that he also create helped create the, the Chicken McNugget. Not that I think that's like, you know, going to solve world hey, hunger, but. <laughs> you know, it goes it goes pretty far. It goes pretty far. Yeah. But as he did this, and he told me how he did it and why he did it, he, you know, he and Croc just understood their business. And they understood the business is about bringing more people into it, not restrict, not not doing it in a sort of heavy handed DEI way. But we want to be in the black community. We want to be in every community. We think it's it's best to be in the black community if black people run the McDonald's in the black community, and so they have they have they have a, a stake in the community, right? And that's a good thing. And you know that that is the way social responsible investing kind of should be done. I always thought, and it makes sense. It, it it doesn't make sense to have something that you know says that if you're an intersection, your intersectionality is. Woman, gay, South American, you get extra points over the coal miner's daughter. That makes no sense to me. And it made no sense to Ed. And he saw it happening. And then mm-hmm. he was watching TV one day and he saw Bob Chapek say that we're we're gonna we're gonna like oppose the Florida law, uh same sex, uh excuse me, the, the sex ed law in Florida. And he said, What the hell is he doing getting involved in this? Doesn't he have a company to run? And then he reached out to the people that ran Bernie Marcus's organization, which is called the Job Creators Network. And, right, and Bernie Marcus, one of the founders of, of Home, Home Depot, Depot you know, who has a similar kind of, uh, you know, working class or low level uh, job nothing. where he, yeah, came and then nothing. developed way, Home Depot. Bernie Marcus was not a speculator, did not make $6 billion or $8 billion, whatever he's worth yeah. speculating in the stock market. Bernie Marcus created, along with Ken Langone and a guy named Arthur Blank, created a great company, create a yeah. lot of jobs. And, you know, Bernie believes that, you know, you should keep the, the virtue signaling to a just employ people, pay them well, 
give them benefits, you know, and go into the communities and yes, hire from the communities. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what you should be doing. And, you know, promote people based on merit. And, you know, and, and yes, I, you know, one thing I want to say is that I'm, I'm in favor of diversity in a big way. Yeah. I've always have been, you know, you know, listen, I'm an Italian American, you know, I grew up in a time when, you know, Italian Americans were not like, you know, you got to, I remember getting an internship at IBM back in the day. People looked at me like I had two eyes, you know, three eyes, or, yeah. you know, you yeah. should, uh, you could lose that. O at the end of your name. Yes. Probably, right. right. I mean, I'm just French telling you that, that diversity is a good thing. You just, it shouldn't be the thing and we shouldn't be politicizing everything. You know, um, there is a natural instinct where people walk out of their building and see more pride flags than American flags. And they're like, what the hell is going on here? You know, pride month. I mean, I hear people talk about pride. I, again, I don't care. You know, it, it literally goes over my head like, like in, in my everyday life. But I hear people talking about it. I hear a cab driver who was an immigrant, by the way. He was an immigrant from from uh, from from the Middle East. He says, why are there all these pride flags and not American flags? He asked me that. We were passing um, Rockefeller Center during Pride Month, and he looked at it. He said, why, what are all the pride flags doing here? Why aren't there I have flags? to tell you, I have a uh, strong conviction against what I call taxicab eurekas. <laughs> I don't believe in taxi drivers as a font of any wisdom, but you're, I think your point is well taken. Um, so, you know, my dad drove there, a cab. My dad did drive uh, a cab when I was a kid. All right, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, but it is, um, you know, it, it. Do you do you have? I mean, at the end of the book, you say it does seem to be receding. You've talked about how, yes. you know, in twenty twenty three, twenty twenty two, is that a kind of natural kind of market cycle? You know, just as there are business cycles, are there cycles for this kind of extra? business activity, you know, where it comes up and then it goes away, you know, because there's and there's a version of it. I mean, or is by American a version of this as well, where it's like you're trying to imbue just basic everyday economic activity with some larger narrative so that you get your way. But, you know, what are we walking away from this kind of stuff? I think we're walking away from it because I think I, I think this is much more resonant anti wokeness is much more resonant than buy American, you know, because even though we had buy American, people still bought iPhones that were made in China. You know what I'm saying? Even maybe an American company, but I, I just think that this just rubs people the wrong way. And I and I don't think you can mass mark the American people are not a monolith. By the way, the American people are diverse, but you know that this it, Trump. Trumpism wouldn't be attracting so many minorities right now if mm -hmm. it wasn't this strain of populism that that that, yeah. that 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 spans across all racial categorizations. And I think by going there in such a hard, crude way, I think you know the 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 counter reaction is is definitely uh, mm -hmm. is, is definitely telling. And then you know. And then on top of it all, we saw what happened on campuses. I, I this mm -hmm. this is like. You know, I get into this in the book, you know, the biggest opponents of the campus sort of unrest that, that, that came about uh, with the, uh, the, the pro-Palestinian marchers were these Wall Street guys that were nominally, you know, progressive. You know, Bill yeah. Ackman, I've known him for years. He's, I think he's always been a Democrat. Mark Rowan, I don't, you know, the, Bill Ackman runs his own hedge fund. Mark Rowan runs mm -hmm. Apollo. I never knew him to be some you know, right winger or anything. Yeah. Uh, but they came out and said we're, we're attacking the 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 the, uh, the schools by saying they they're, they're they're brainwashing the kids and with this woke curriculum, and. Um, I think that was kind of an interesting inflection point. There was also an interesting point to be made to them, which I did, and I address it in the book. You know, where were you, like, over the last 10 years when all the money you were giving to the endowments of, of your schools, and you knew what was going, you didn't know what was going on? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe they didn't. I don't think they did. I don't think they were they were given money to create economic chairs for you know, to, to, for, um, you know, to, to indoctrinate kids into left, you know, progressivism. But but they either didn't do any diligence or they kind of went along with it because Harvard's Harvard, right? You pen is you pen. These are good schools. Right. I'm going to give them money because it reflects well. Yeah, and it really, they really sowed the seeds of what they, uh, what they're opposing. I, I make that point in the book. And I think 
that is, I think I think those protests, those pro Hamas protests, when people juxtaposed against the the barbarism. I mean, you can be against the war. You know, I hate seeing pictures of kids being blown up in this, this yeah. conflict. I mean, you can be against that and not understand the difference and yeah. um, what they're doing on what they're preaching at these campuses with, with the with the protests are are supporting and why it's bad. And, you know, I think that that was a big, a big nail in the coffin, I think, of wokeness. I mean, yeah. it, was, it's, it definitely it's, shattered a lot of uh, right. solidarity on the on the left. I've met a lot of people who t- five years ago might have said I'm progressive. Now they say I'm liberal. You know, they want to separate from the far left. That is kind of objectively pro Hamas. Yeah, and, bus- I mean, and businesses aren't hiring from some of those schools because of it. That right. is part of the backlash. Uh, as a final question, you know, uh, OK, so the uh, presidential race is down to, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. I mean, I, you know, RFK or Chase Oliver might win. We never know. You know, anything we can happen. Hope. But. <laughs> or, you know, between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, who do you think will be better or worse for the economy? You know, I I worry about both of them. I I, I think, you know, Donald has, I mean, I think one of our biggest problems is debt right now and entitlements. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's showed no inclination to address that. No. I mean, he's, he's taking them off the table. Taking them off the table. The right. one thing, though, that I think, and, and Kamala Harris, I think, you know, you could fit as much as she knows about the economy in my in the cavity in the back. You know, this this is this is someone who's I don't think is 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 got the uh, the bandwidth to be president. Uh, I mean, Biden didn't, and you know, this is um, this is just doubling down uh, in a different way. You know, you know, just just. All you have to do is listen to her explain inflation, and that's bouncing around the internet to know that this, this is scary stuff. I mean, this is somebody that really could do some damage to the economy. Now, Trump can too, but I think based on who I know that'll be around them, there'll be much many more free market types around them. And I think that's where I come out. You know, if you're asking me who I, I I'm not going to vote. To be be honest, I never vote. Yeah, it's just hard to get me to vote. But uh, well, we are we're talking on uh, Monday, August fifth. This will go up about a week or so after this, and the markets have been, you know, in a real tumble lately. Are we? Uh, you know, here's a prediction, to, and we'll see if it's true in a week or whenever this goes up. You know, is this the beginning of a long, long time coming reckoning? Because we've had. You know, unrestrained spending. We've had weird supply shocks. We've had political instability, not just in the United States, but all over oh, the yeah. world and things like that. You know, people have been talking about a, a serious recession that is distinct from the COVID recession or, you know, when we did the lockdowns, which actually Trump instigated. But are, do you think we're in the beginning of a, of a, of a serious reset in the economy? Um, I do. It's it's all over the place on Wall Street. Jamie Dimon has been predicting it for a long time. The CEO of J.P. Morgan, uh, Larry Fink, who like I, he's in the book, but he's a smart yeah. market guy. Says there's they pump so much money in the economy, he doesn't see how it might happen. There's still a lot of liquidity. I think the problem that that the economy has is, is now the numbers are starting to reflect what the average person has been feeling. Okay. Um, and you know, take out what Jamie Dimon says, take out what Fink says, you know, the average person, the working class person, when they, when they pulled them on the economy, said it was horrible, even though employment was, you know, full employment and Mm -hmm. Joe Biden saying everything is great. The average person was like, "Eh, inflation is killing me. And it wasn't just the average person couldn't afford it. You know, the, you know, the interest rates were crushing them on their home loan because that, that wasn't the case. The, The case was that, if they pump so much liquidity in the system, the average person couldn't afford to take the average couple of, you know, the average family of four couldn't afford a dinner at Applebee's on Friday. Mm-hmm. And I think that was, oh, that was there for a long time. The, the White House tried to spin us out of that as, oh, no, no, that's just psychological. They just don't like Joe Biden because he stutters and all this. And they don't like Kamala Harris because she laughs funny. But it, it was like a real feeling because people that's the way people felt because that was their pocketbook. 
And, you know, that sort of, that, that sort of long-term inflationary spiral, it's, even though the rate's coming down, prices are still high yeah. and wages have not caught up, that does have an impact on the economy because people stop doing stuff if they can't afford it. And I think that's what's, that's, those are the chickens that are coming home to roost now. Now the numbers are literally, if you look at them now, not just the last week's employment numbers, but even before that, I, I did a column in the Post, which talked about, you know, I interviewed people before the employment report. So they were talking about how we were going in this direction. The numbers are piling up that we are entering an economic slowdown. Now, does it, 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 does it come fast? Does it come slow? Does it come at the end of the year? Does the Fed cutting rates help? Marginally, maybe. I don't think it really does, to be honest with you. Uh, the um, uh, the the real economy, but uh, you know we're heading in that direction. I don't know how you say we're not heading in that direction because the numbers are all saying it now. And the course, last time we had this magnitude of issues, really, I mean, you got to go back to the late seventies and early eighties. Yeah, and, uh, and do you think it, it's go never good for the party in power? I mean, I remember again. I broke a lot of stories during the financial crisis. That was right in the middle of the 2008 financial, uh, 2008 election. And I remember right before Lehman Brothers blew up in September, I believe McCain was ahead of, of Obama. Or you know, I, tied. I'm not sure about that. But tied yeah, or I mean, it was really closer. But, yeah, yeah, they were close. And by the way, and he was ahead before that, but it was a slide into Lehman. And then it just, his numbers just went straight down. And, no. you know, th this is, if this does happen, it's not, it's generally not good for the party in power. And, um, you know, that, 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 that could help Trump. I mean, it's a black swan, so to speak, but it could help Trump. All right. All right. We're going to leave it there. I've been talking with Charlie Gasparino uh, at the New York Post, as well as the author of Go Woke, Go Broke, the inside story of the radicalization of corporate America. Charles Gasparino, thanks for talking. And don't forget Fox News and Fox Business. <laughs> and Fox News and Fox Business. Okay, fair enough. Thanks, thanks so much. It. Thank you.